much. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. I wanted to just um, kind of start by introducing myself. So I didn't even know what a dietitian was until I almost was one. So a dietitian is trained and educated in human metabolism, um, chemistry, nutrition, science, education, counseling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, I did my training in Alabama, did a, a couple of degrees in nutrition sciences. So the one thing I just want to start off today, because this can kind of get into being a heavy topic is dietitians, we are not the food police. Most of us started our careers out because we were so excited about the complex and beautiful relationship between what we put in our bodies and how it impacts every aspect of our health. And we just love food so much that we want to share that knowledge and help other people love it as much as we do. So not the food police. Uh, so I'd like that this says as dietitians, we're here to help you find a way to eat nutritiously that is sustainable and enjoyable. And those are some good things to keep in mind as we move into this topic today. So just to briefly review our agenda, um, I wanna go over just quickly some basics of nutrition science and food, um, and then we'll get into the, the heavier topics. So what is diet, diet culture, impacts and dangers of it, how to identify red flags uh, when you're making choices in your diet and changes, and where to get started when trying to achieve what's called food freedom. And we'll go over kind of what that means um, and ways to shift our thinking in order to make more sustainable, healthy habits. So a little bit of a disclaimer, um, the goal today is not for me to sell you on the newest diet. It's quite the opposite. Um, there, the reason behind that is there is no such thing as a one size fits all. Um, but we all share a lot of the same barriers to reaching our nutrition goals. So hopefully by the end of today, we can start breaking down some of those barriers and um, start moving forward. All right, so we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, just a really brief review or introduction of Food Science Nutrition 101. I wanted to do this um, first because too often when we're talking about food and nutrition, we tend to think about them in terms of like negative associations or bad or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted just to state some basic facts um, that we can build on and be knowledgeable about when moving forward and making choices. So of course we can't learn everything about nutrition in a quick few minutes in a segment of a webinar, um, but hopefully it can help uh, lay or build on a foundation that you may already have. Okay, so we will get started. Um, so macros or macronutrients. That is probably something you've heard of or seen in the media. Um, what that means is it's just simply the nutrients needed in a large amount that provide the, our bodies with energy that we need to maintain function. There are three macronutrients and those are protein, fats, and carbohydrates. The energy provided by those macronutrients is measured in units called kilocalories, or we know them as calories. So just to briefly go into each macronutrient, first we'll talk a little bit about protein. So protein is a very complex molecule and it is in every single cell in our human bodies. It's necessary for growth, development, helps to build um, and repair cells and tissues. It's a major part of our skin, hair, nails, muscle, bone, internal organs. Literally every single cell has protein in it. Um, it's also really important for many body processes such as blood clotting, fluid balance, our immune response, um, something very important these days, vision, hormone production, regulation, antibodies and enzymes. Um, a little bit more on protein. So they, those big protein molecules are built up from a bunch of smaller amino acids. Um, there's two different types of amino acids and they're essential versus non-essential. What that means, um, essential means that your body cannot create it by itself and you have to obtain it from foods. Non-essential means that your body can make it. Um, so the reason I wanted to just briefly talk about that is because not all food sources have all of the amino acids that you need. So when you look at the animal products um, that provide amino acids, they have all the essential. 
but with the um the plant-based ones you have to pair certain ones and get a variety in order to get all the amino acids needed for all of our body functions to work properly protein is found in beans legumes nuts and seeds dairy products eggs obviously meat and poultry um, seafood like fish and self shellfish um, soy and soy products as well so the next macronutrient we'll talk briefly about is uh, fats. So fats provide energy and they also give us a storage form of energy um, for really important times where maybe we um, don't have enough quick energy from, from other macronutrients um, or if we're in our starvation mode or for other reasons as well, I mean, we may need extra storage forms. Um, it's also important to protect our internal organs. Um, fat supports our blood clotting, nervous system function, reproduction, and immune function. It also is essential in the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. Um, those fat-soluble ones are listed there, meaning if you, um, you know, have some type of vitamin without its food form and you're just drinking it with water, it's not going to absorb unless you have some type of fat in your intake at that time. And fats are also really important for improving our cell membrane integrity, which allows for proper cell function. That's a really general statement um, that just means we need fat for basically everything to function properly. <laughs> and then the um, just to build on that a little bit. So fats are big molecules built up of smaller fatty acids. Um, one type of fatty acid group is omega-3s. And I wanted just to talk about these um, just to share, it's one of my favorite things because there's so much research on it that has been shown to decrease inflammation. Um, it can decrease prevalence of breast cancer. It also improves or prevents cardiovascular disease, um, all kinds of great things, right? Um, one of my favorite things about fats too, is that it provides flavor and can help us feel full and satisfied with our meals. So there are two major types of fats. Um, there's saturated and unsaturated. The saturated ones there are solid at room temperature and they come from animal sources with the exception of coconut oil. And then unsaturated or liquid at room temperature and they come from plant sources. Um, and all of the fats are found in foods such as nuts, fatty fish, um, any oil, seeds, meat fats, um, poultry skin, butter, full fat dairy, shortening, olives, margarine, and avocados. Um, those are the major sources. So for our last macronutrient and my personal favorite, carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are our body's primary number one source of fuel, and it's the brain's preferred source of fuel as well. So it it's absolutely essential for fueling our, our kidney function, our heart muscles to work, our central nervous system. It promotes immune and digestive health. It keeps us full and satisfied. And certain types of carbohydrates can improve our cholesterol levels and, and, and prevent or manage cardiovascular disease. So the little tidbit there at the bottom, it says a deficiency in carbohydrates can cause headaches, fatigue, weakness, difficulty concentrating, nausea, constipation, and vitamin, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So that's all fancy schmancy talk for. It can make you hangry. There is an actual scientific process between not having enough carbohydrates and how it can affect your, your mentation and your mood. Um, yeah. So more on carbohydrates. So there are, if you're talking about grains, um, grains are a source of carbohydrate. There are two major types whole grains and refined grains. So what happens when you refine a grain, and I love this illustration here, is you take this beautiful whole grain that has all of its parts and all of its good stuff, and you take the bran um, and you take the germ out. So you're left with the endosperm, which is um, maintains the structural part of it, but it, when you have a whole grain, it still um, contains the fiber, the vitamins, the minerals, uh, the antioxidants, all that good stuff. So fiber, um, can, which is a type of carbohydrate. It improves our GI health. It lowers our, bad, our LDL or bad cholesterol. It makes us feel full and satisfied when we eat. And it is found in whole grains, which we just talked about. It's also found in fruits, non-starchy vegetable, which is um, any vegetable besides potatoes, peas, and corn, pretty much. 
Um, it's also found in beans, seeds, and legumes. Um, other sources of carbohydrates, um, of course, there's grains, but there's bread, cereals, rice, pasta, um, beans, nuts, legumes, fruit, starchy vegetables, um, table sugar, honey, syrups, candy, juice, sweetened beverages, and milk. Okay. So we talked about macronutrients, the big guys. Then there's micronutrients. Those are the nutrients needed in a small amount that are required for a wide range of um, pretty much every function to facilitate growth, development, and maintain our health. So the micronutrients are vitamins and minerals, and there's so many of them, and they all have so many functions. Um, there's no possible way we could go over all of them today. But the reason I wanted to bring this up is because this being said, it's they're found in varying amounts in different types of foods. So it's important to have a variety in our diets in order to prevent deficiencies in vitamins and minerals and to optimize our function. And I wanted to just very briefly um, talk about, because the hot topic here, micronutrients, vitamins, talk about supplements, right? So think about a, a vitamin or mineral in its food form. Typically for a vitamin or mineral to absorb at its best capacity, also known as bioavailability, um, it needs other things things to help it absorb and be utilized in our body is the best way. There's also different forms that can be absorbed and utilized more efficiently. So in its food form, typically it's, it's already packed with all the other things it needs. Um, and it's in the great form, but then we have, when we have supplements, sometimes it's the bioavailability or the ability for it to be absorbed and utilized in our bodies is less efficient. Um, and that's why we always tend to try food first, but of course they're is a, a place for supplementation when needed as well. Um, but a caution with that is they're not tested by um, any governing agency. So um, another tidbit there. So we talked about essential versus non-essential um, with, with the other things, but that's true with micronutrients as well. So with the exception of vitamin D, we do not produce any of these. So we have to get them from food. That's why it's so important to get a variety in our diets. And the last little tidbit on nutrition food science 101, what is diet? Diet literally is defined as the foods and drinks consumed by an individual. Simple, plain, just like that. What diet does not mean is restrictive eating. So there's so many fad diets and trends out there. It has conditioned many of us into thinking that diet means restrictive eating of some type. So I'm going to use that as our segue into our next topic. So this one can get a little heavy. Um, so I have some fun, very uh, educational illustrations here to help lighten the mood until we get to the part where we figure out how to combat this heavy stuff. So diet culture, what is it? What is diet culture? So diet culture refers to the set of beliefs that values thinness, appearance, and shape above health and well-being, The concept places importance on restricting calories, um, normalizes negative self-talk and labels certain foods as good and bad. So we'll build on that. Um, first, I wanted to talk about one of the major impacts um, of, of diet culture. So with all these different influencers and celebrities and pretty much everyone talking about the newest cleanse, the newest detox, the newest fad diet out there. They're promoting it as the best way to lose weight or um, they know someone who, who it worked out for them. It's really common for, for us in our modern age to fall into this pattern of bouncing from one diet to the next. And that is called yo-yo dieting. Um, so dieting in general, especially yo-yo, um, there's a lot of dangers to that. And we'll, we'll build on that. And it may seem kind of counterintuitive at first, but um, the dangers based on research and, and all kinds of things is one is physiological. So hormone dysregulation is, is very common amongst people who um, bounce between diets. So you could have reproductive concerns. You could lose the ability to um, use your hunger and your, your satiety cues. It also very effectively impairs our metabolic function, um, meaning that it makes us less efficient at using the energy that we're intaking from food or slows our metabolism. Um, it also can decrease our lean body mass. Um, so that's the, 
the physiological. There's also the psychological side. So oftentimes this type of dieting or any type of dieting leads to um, body image issues and disordered eating patterns, including like food obsession, shame, guilt, anxiety associated with food, and can often lead to full-blown eating disorders. Also, crazy statistic there. So research, research shows that 95% of people who, who diet, and we're using the, the term diet that, um, like restrictive eating of some sort, not the what you eat in a day definition. So, so 95% of people who diet or restrict their diet in some form uh, for weight loss will regain their lost weight within one to five years. 95%, it's wild. So let's talk a little bit about dieting and eating disorders just to build on what we just reviewed. So let's just dive right into the research. Um, and it's kind of mind blowing. So 35% of all dieting progresses to pathologic dieting. And of those 35%, 20 to 25% progress into full-blown eating disorders. And this is all based off of recent research. The most common eating disorder is called binge eating. Um, between 30 to 40% of those who seek weight loss treatments can be clinically diagnosed with binge eating disorder. 40 to 60% of girls from the ages six to 12 are concerned about their weight or becoming fat or too fat. Six to 12. 46% of um, children ages nine to 11 are sometimes or very often on diets and 82% of their families are sometimes or very often on diets. And what that means by sometimes very often, that means they're, they're in that yo-yo kind of pattern. Over 50% of teenage girls and 33% of teenage boys are restricting their diet in order to lose weight at any given time. 91% of college women have attempted to control their weight through dieting and 22% admit that they diet often or always. 45% of American women and 25% of American men, that's of all ages, are on a diet at any given day. Crazy. So I wanted to touch on um, and maybe a, a type of eating disorder that's not as commonly known, um, but is very commonly diagnosed these days. It's called orthorexia nervosa. So the definition um, of that is just an unhealthy obsession with or focus on foods that someone considers healthy. Um, when it's when they systematically avoid specific foods due to the belief that they are harmful. So some people are like, oh, well, they're, you know, they're, they're focused on healthy foods. And why is that a bad thing? Right. But what we see is that people who suffer from this often associate their self-worth and their feelings about themselves based on what they eat. And that's known as emotional eating. And that often leads to loss of control. Um, not just with their diet, but with other aspects of their lives as well. Int intense guilt and shame around food um, that causes negative impacts on our social lives and impacts our relationships with other people. So the um, really great photo over there. So risks of orthorexia nervosa, um, heart disease, kidney failure, deficiencies, weakened immune system, brain fog, social isolation. Just want to bring that one up. So... Let's just talk about the media. Um, we can't not talk about it when we're talking about diet culture, right? So a survey in 2019 showed that 90% of Americans aged 18 to 29 use social media every single day. That's not surprising. Um, but another sh study showed that 70% of women and 50% of men admit to regularly editing their appearance in some way on social media posts. A 2010 study in elementary school girls showed that nearly 70% admitted that photos influence their concept of ideal body shape, and nearly half of them admit that the picture makes them want to lose weight. Elementary school, it's wild. So some of you may be wondering what the body parts has to do with nutrition, um, but all this kind of goes hand in hand. So. We're just gonna go through this very briefly because we're going to build on all of these things um, as we go through this webinar. 
So how to identify what is diet culture? Um, what does it mean? So it's, it's when you see food as either good or bad, demonizing certain foods and elevating others, um, the term superfoods or this is the best blah, blah, blah. Um, if something creates shame when eating foods that are perceived bad, having guilt after eating something. If you, if someone is following very rigid food rules that um, have us ignore our hunger and fullness cues. Associating body size or body shape with health. Tying a scale number to our happiness. Tying weight gain or weight loss to status or morals. Or thinking or commenting things such as, um, I'm being good or I'm being bad today, or it's my cheat day, um, or I'll burn this off at the gym later, or you look good, have you lost weight? Um, or that's so good, that's so bad for you, or you have so much willpower. And we're gonna build on these things. Um, so we're starting to see hopefully how, how deeply rooted this is and how normalized it's become. So to build on what rigid food rules means, um, so what this could be anything. Um, it could be the foods that you are allowing yourself to eat or that you, um, when you're allowed to eat them, how you're allowed to eat them, et cetera, et cetera. It could be on anything. Um, that is a, def is a type of disordered eating pattern. So we get these rigid food rules from all over the place. And it can be really hard to navigate between what is good information and what is not. So common sources of these rigid food rules um, are from family, friends, entertainment, social media, sports and fitness, um, authority figures. So we can learn these from um, people that we looked up to or learned from, and even health professionals. Um, so it's important to note that um, not all health professionals and many health professionals do not receive um, a comprehensive nutrition training. So let's just go right on into diet culture and how to identify red flags. And don't worry, there are green flags later. There is a bright side of this, I promise. <laughs> so if something promises you fast results, boom, red flag. Um, if it works really fast, that's, it's typically something that um, is not sustainable for long term, and it can, going back to what we talked about already, it can damage our metabolism, our hormones, all the kinds of things, right? Restricts or eliminates a whole food group. So we talked about all three macronutrients, carbohydrates, fats, proteins. And we talked about all the great things about them and what they do for us. If we eliminate one of them from our diets um, or we over-restrict one, then that leaves us lacking in a lot of ways for our overall body function. If it lists good and bad foods or allowed and not allowed foods, um, back to that picture before. So foods are morally, they're morally neutral. Um, there's no good or bad food in and of itself. And again, we'll build on that too. If, if the diet lacks variety or lacks flexibility. So again, building on that thing we talked about from um, our micronutrients. So we need a variety in our diets. Um, sticking to just one or two items isn't going to give us everything that we need. It's going to leave us deficient. Um, and going back to all those dangers again, this physiological and psychological. If it's an expensive miracle product. Um, again, there's no one size fits all. And then there's no miracle cure because we are complex beings and we have different needs. All of us do. Um, Next, if it claims, if its claims are based off of before and after photos. So big red flag there. If all of us ate the exact same things every day and exercise the exact same way, we would all still look different and be healthy in our own individual ways. If it's based on celebrity endorsement, um, celebrities don't have nutrition training. And if there's harmful food language around it, um, like for example, if it's demon, you know, going back to some other thing, if it's demonizing certain things or, or making things more fat phobic or um, just having that negative self talk associated with it. If you're always hungry, if it 
if it's over-restrictive, you're always hungry, you're not satisfied. So fear-mongering, um, if, if the diet is promoting something um, based off of something else being bad or dangerous or trying to promote fear in people from eating something, um, a lot of that can be explained and debunked and there's a lot of misinformation out there. So if a diet does not allow eating after a specific time of the day, um, we have to honor our hunger and our fullness cues. So there's no, you know, if it's a super strict um, time regimen, then that's a red, big red flag there. Any form of a proclaimed cleanse or detox. Um, so there's a lot of these out there. Um, cleanses, detoxes, the premise is that you, that the individuals um, restrict to juice or some type of liquid beverage or, or something for, for a period of time to detox or flush out um, toxins and excess things. So what that really does is um, it makes our metabolism decrease and become less efficient. It puts us in uh, too much of a calorie deficit. Um, and mostly we're just losing our water weight and with our having slow metabolism, it, we're gaining everything right back and it can be even more afterwards. So, um, yeah. It, and back on the, the detox part, we have a, a lot of beautiful, complex, very efficient processes in our body that do all the cleansing and the detoxing for us. And I promise if there were extra toxins in there, um, you would know it because you would be very sick and calling your doctor. <laughs> if it demonizes processed foods. Um, so process is one of those words that um, can be really confusing because it means something different to everyone. Um, same thing with like clean eating. So process simply means it could be any process has been done to it. So even if something has two ingredients and they're smashed together, um, that is processing. So process doesn't mean bad. And there's a reason why convenience um, foods are out there. And there's just a lot of misinformation. So if it creates antisocial behavior or fear or anxiety over eating out with friends or family. So if you are following something and it makes it to where you can't meet up with your loved ones or your friends or, or, um, or be flexible. If it promotes excessive swaps or supplements or food products sold by the company that's promoting it. Um, so obviously they're trying to sell you something. Um, and they're going to make a profit off of it. So there's a lot of judgments there that, and misinformation typically. So big red flag. All right. So let's just let that lead us right into um, disordered habits that have been normalized by society. And I promise after this, it'll, it'll um, we've got some fun, exciting things, but a lot of these are, are things that I, I personally have thought or done or um, many of the people I know to have, I see it all over social media. I see it over the news. It's yeah. so it's going to dive right into it. So again, disordered habits that have been normalized by society, going by time to tell you what and when to eat. So that intentionally ignores your body hunger cues, drinking water instead of eating when you feel hungry. My favorite, uh, like dietitian joke that we talk about is, you know, when you, and not to be crass or anything here, but when you need to, to go number two, you don't go number one, right? So it's, you have to listen to your body. One need does not suffice for a whole separate need. So chewing gum to distract yourself from hunger cues. Um, relying on gadgets to tell us what and when to eat. The concept of good days versus cheat days. Throwing food that you label bad away or eating it all quickly so that it's no longer available for you to eat. And using exercise to quote, earn or make up for food. So again, all these are, are disordered habits that have been normalized. So this is a really fun, interesting topic. Uh, I wanted to go over just the course of history and, and how this all kind of came to fruition. 
and how it's developed and changed as the times have changed. So going all the way back, we'll just go ahead and start with 1920s. That's when they created laxatives and soaps sold to quote, wash the fat away. Um, so there's an, that's an actual ad from the 1920s posted there. It says, wash away pounds of fat, double chins and years of age with um, Lamar reducing soap. So it's already produ producing fat phobia and, and, and all that negative self-talk. Um, so next one, 1930s, cigarettes were promoted as an appetite suppressant. So the thing here says to keep a slender figure, no one can deny, and it's a, it's a cigarette ad. So 1940s. So that was when the boom of weight loss pills started um, after World War II. They were actually using methamphetamine or, or um, amphetamine salts as, as appetite suppressants after World War II. Um, obviously, they have stopped doing that since. So 1950s was the birth of the strict one specific food item for X amount of time diet trends. Um, I believe there was some famous person who did the grapefruit diet or the Hollywood diet was the, the first well-known one um, where this star, you know, only ate grapefruit for two weeks and lost a whole bunch of weight. And that was promoted in, in all the newspapers and um, magazines, things like that. 1960s, so Weight Watchers was created. But the the thing there that was concerning was that the founder self described herself as an overweight housewife, wife obsessed with cookies. Um, so again, that negative self talk, negative associations. 1980s, love that photo. Those leg warmers, amazing. So um, that's when aerobics really took off, um, and it introduced the the whole earn your calories, negative self-talk um, concept. Um, and just some more that I didn't put on here. So 1990s is really when celebrities promoting diets uh, became really popular, which continues obviously into today's media age. So just some examples there. So 1990, Elizabeth Taylor um, said that if you eat veggies and dip every day at 3 p.m., you'll look like me. And then um, Oprah pulls up a wagon of, of like fake fat to represent the 70, the 67 pounds she lost on a quote liquid diet. Um, so then everyone wanted to do the liquid diet. 1994 was when they added the nutrition facts label, which is excellent and a great way for us to all stay informed, um, and educated, but it also created opportunity for, um, obsessing over calorie counting. Um, 2004 is when that show, The Biggest Loser, started. 2006, so Beyonce started the Master Cleanse. Um, she told everyone that she lost almost 40 pounds for some music video by drinking hot water, lemon juice, maple syrup, and cayenne pepper. Um, and, and just to build on that, so in 2001, a, a content analysis of all weight loss advertisements found more than 50% of ads for weight loss products used false, unsubstantiated claims. Um, and if this little demonstration here doesn't just really show how dangerous and misinformed a lot of our, our diet culture style advertisements and things can be, um, then I don't know what will. So the last little um, things I want to talk about on just diet culture in and of itself. Um, so what we just talked about, obviously, what promotes diet culture is our media age, advertisements, um, influencers, celebrities, but also it comes from labeling foods as bad or clean or guilt-free, um, unsolicited weight loss tips, and complimenting someone's weight loss. So let's talk about that for a second. So if you're complimenting someone's weight loss, we may be unknowingly complimenting or encouraging um, an eating disorder or a cancer diagnosis or depression or some type of illness, grief, or some type of unhealthy weight loss, strict enrichment. Um, so it's really important when considering um, these dangers to find other ways to compliment people other than their weight. Again, weight is not associated um, with our morality or our status. Um, just gonna leave that there. So some takeaway points. Restriction. 
pretty much almost always leads to binging. Restrictive dieting almost always leads to weight gain. There is no one size fits all diet. The effects of diet culture are very deeply rooted into today's society. Reminder, exercise is not a punishment for eating, nor is it a means to earn food. Food is not something that we have to earn. It is a nourishment and it does not require justification. Um, so I love this thing there. It says, you know, it's healthier than kale, having a good relationship with food. Um, it's a little silly, but simply put there. And before we keep moving on, I want to say that this stuff has, has been going on for, for decades and in, in all of our lives, basically. Um, it's not going to, we're not able to reroute our thinking overnight, but awareness um, and identification and shifting that can be the hardest part to get started. So it's what we're hoping to accomplish today. Right. So skipped one. So food freedom. Let's go ahead and, and dive right into, um, into steps to find balance within our diets, start healing our relationship with food, rebuild our intuitive eating habits, and work towards sustainable healthy results, not the yo-yo. So food freedom. So what diet culture wants us to think the problems are. So diet culture is always promoting like, we'll fix your problem. This is the issue if you change these things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what diet culture says is the problem. So it thinks processed foods, but the actual problem is a poor relationship with food. Diet culture says sugar is bad, but food fear is really the big danger. Um, weight gain is not the issue, but associating body size with value and status is. Body fat is not a bad thing. Fat phobia is very dangerous. Skipping a workout, not a problem, but body shaming is. Um, and having negative feelings, we all have them, um, but we just can't avoid them. So one really awesome tool is to be able to identify that negative food language and start to shift that into more positive food language um, or just more factual. So instead of using terms like it's good or it's bad, again, food is morally neutral. Um, instead of good, bad, healthy, unhealthy, clean, skinny, guilt-free, junk food, empty calories, toxic. We could just be referring to them as energizing nourishing, nutrient rich, delicious, filling, satisfying, fun, brings me joy. Food should be enjoyed. I will say that now and I'll probably say it 10 more times before the end of um, this hour, but food should be enjoyed. So um, another way, just building on the shifting our language around food, so diet culture says salads are morally good or always a good choice or punishment for eating too much. Um, but instead, salads are food, a meal, a salad. Um, sounds simple, but that shift is a big change. Calories. So uh, diet culture wants us to think calories are bad, um, something to burn off, the lower the better. But we just learned or reviewed um, that a calorie is simply a unit of energy. Um, needed for our bodies to function, or they're just calories. Exercise, uh, diet culture wants us to think it's either a punishment for eating too much, it's painful, and the more we do it, the better. But really, it's just something that should make us happy, something that should be fun, and it looks different for everyone. Um, there was a study that asked people what they thought of like exercise or working out, and Almost everyone said like going to the gym, lifting weights. There are so many other types of exercises, um, especially if those of you who are here are local, um, you know, we have so many different options and, and there's always different options out there other than, you know, going to the gym and lifting weights. It looks different for every person, every size, every shape, every age. Um, and even for us individually, it will change as we go through our lives. So instead of, I love this one, Instead of diet culture telling us ice cream is junk food or bad or fattening, ice cream is food. It is a snack or dessert. It's just ice cream. Again, food is morally neutral. Um, no food in and of itself is fattening. Um, yeah. 
So I love these diagrams here. So we talked about this a little bit. So it's very common to use terms like good food and bad food, but the only bad food is food that's rotten, spoiled, or contaminated. Um, so foods are, are labeled like that. They don't need one. Um, there's no bad foods. There can be unbalanced. There can be imbalance, um, but no food in and of itself is bad. We're good. And then look at the, the one on the right there. So dirty eating versus clean eating. There was another study that looked at, it asked people to define what clean eating meant to them. And oh my goodness, almost everyone said something different. Um, but what it does is creates a stigma around eating certain ways and implies that eating other ways is dirty, um, which just isn't true. The only way eating would be dirty is if there's dirt on it. So um, and that potato, that's a dirty potato right there. So unless your food is covered in dirt, there is no need to label it as dirty or clean. All right, so this is a really, 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 really helpful tool in um, discovering our food freedom. So what we can do is um, a self-check. So when considering diet changes, you can ask yourself, does this make me cut out an entire food group? Does this seem too restrictive? Will it take the joy out of eating? Will I constantly be hungry? Will this mean that I won't be able to eat with my friends and family? Will I realistically follow this for more than a few weeks? When you're trying or in the process of trying a new diet, ask yourself, do I feel more tired or hangry? Um, am I always craving more food? Has my mood changed since starting the diet? I know if I haven't had enough food, I'm not very fun to be around. Um, am I constantly worrying or thinking about food, obsession about food? Does this make me strictly track every calorie or weigh myself regularly? If you answer yes to any of those questions, the diet in question is not the right fit to nourish your body the way it needs to be nourished. So green flags, making dietary choices. Um, so if it keeps you full and satisfied, big green check there, brings you joy, it very much should, makes you feel good, keeps you energized. There's a lot of variety. There's no hard exclusions, um, allows all foods in all groups. Um, obviously, if you have allergies and things like that, that's an exception. Um, if you feel in control, if you eat what you want without guilt, morally neutral, it's flexible. You can go on vacation and you didn't feel like you fail yourself because you shouldn't. If it honors your hunger cues, listens to your body cues instead of tracking and it promotes respect of our bodies, sustainable for long-term. That right there is very important. So you gotta throw the Oprah in here. Brought her up earlier, got to redeem her a little bit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about intuitive eating. There are 10 primary principles. Now intuitive eating, I could talk about for six hours. Um, so this is just a very brief review. Um, but the 10 primary principles are um, number one, ditch this whole diet thing. Um, you start honoring our hunger, making peace with food, challenging the food police, not dietitians. Um, it's satisfying. It, you get to start feeling your fullness, cope with your emotions with kindness, respect your body, promotes joyful movement, not um, kind that's, that's not fun. It should be fun, should make us feel good. And it honors our individual health and needs. Um, our bodies are all different. They all have different needs. And um, we have to be mindful of that. Again, no one size fits all. So some self-care tips to combat diet culture in the media, um, unfollow any accounts that trigger negative self-talk or promote unsustainable restrictive habits, limit screen time, advocate for positive body self-talk. Um, the more you preach it, the more you feel it. So um, reminding yourself that filters and photoshopping is often used by pretty much everyone. Um, so what you see on there is not real. Um, continuing to educate yourself on healthy, sustainable eating patterns, knowledge is power. Um, and following accounts of credentialed professionals whose content helps to support your sustainable goals. We control what we see for the most part. And oh, got a little lag there. All right. So really quickly reviewing SMART goals. Um, so oftentimes we can get ahead of ourselves um, and make too big of goals too quickly. And um, they're just not sustainable and they leave us feeling like we failed even though we didn't. So SMART goals means specific, so it needs to be action-oriented. Again, losing weight is not an action. 
what, rather it's a result of an action, right? So what do you want to do? Um, it needs to be measurable. So how will you know if you've achieved it? Um, it has to be achievable, realistic. Um, so is it in your power to accomplish it? Am I going to run a marathon tomorrow? Absolutely not. Um, can you achieve it? So, and then time that helps us just kind of monitor it. So here's an example here. Um, I will drink eight ounces of water before lunch, three out of five days a week on work days this week from Monday to Friday. And I like the confidence there too. So you ask yourself, how sure am I that I can do this? And you want it to be a pretty high number. And if it's not a high number, then going back and readjusting that goal. All right, so food freedom, some takeaway points here. Um, what you eat should fuel and nourish your body rather than deprive it of valuable nutrients. Bottom line, the right diet for your body is one that's sustainable, one that fits your unique needs and goals, one that preserves the joy of eating, keeps you energized, and it does not leave you feeling hungry. If you have to sacrifice your happiness and other aspects of your life to, to achieve a certain aesthetic, then that's not the right aesthetic for your health. Um, and while societal messages often imply that emotional eating, body fat changes and indulgence is bad, the reality is not, couldn't be any more different. So our emotional connection to food is an instinct that we are born with, um, and it should be valued and utilized as a tool to build intuitive eating habits. Our bodies are really strong. They change all the time and they're meant to, and food is an important critical function into our lives. So my favorite phrase, you got to nourish to flourish. Um, also know that if you um, have specific individual needs and concerns, you can always reach out to a registered dietitian um, and uh, as part dietitians are available for consultation. And any questions? That was great. Thank you so much. Um, just a good reminder that if you do have questions, um, feel free to um, type them into the chat box or the Q and A. Um, I, there was, since you were just talking about your contact information, um, a question about insurance coverage. And I know that's a very big question, but if you can answer in a simple way, that'd be helpful. Yes. If insurance could ever be simple, which it rarely is. Yeah. Um, but if you are in California, um, if you have, if it's not private insurance, I do cover nutrition counseling for most things. Um, depends on your plan, if there's a copay, et cetera. Um, but in California, yes, Nevada is a little bit more complicated. If you have private insurance, um, I could talk to you privately, but that's a little more complicated. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And I appreciate that you put your contact information so people can um, write that down. There was a question that came up. I think it was around the beginning um, when you were talking about carbohydrates and uh, okay. there was a question around gluten. And so I don't yeah. know. I know that's also probably a big topic, but if you could speak. Yeah, it is. So gluten is technically a protein found in carbohydrates. So again, pairing those that no food just has one macronutrient, right? But they're majorly one or the other. So gluten is a, again, a, it's a, a type of protein um, found in wheat, barley, and rye. Um, so if you have celiac or gluten intolerance, obviously you want to avoid that, but otherwise there's no reason. Um, it's just like any other protein found in any other carb, if, as long as you, your body can metabolize it. Great. Um, answer that question. Yep. There's another question about, um, all kinds of foods for osteoporosis. Do you have suggestions for foods for someone with osteoporosis? Yeah. So there's certain foods that are really high in calcium, um, vitamin D it depends on, uh, your other health conditions as well. Um, but foods that are rich in those nutrients, and then again, having a, a wide variety of, of nutrients in your diet, um, getting those um, micronutrients to promote and fight inflammation, um, and then getting a lot of foods that are high in calcium, vitamin D, and those things. Okay, great. Um, looks like Paige Clock um, has raised their hand, so I'm going to see if we can allow great. her to talk. Paige, if you're there, you can go ahead. You can unmute yourself and try to ask the question. Otherwise, Q and A always works well too. Yeah. Um, and while she's working on that, um, 
I will just let everyone know maybe who joined late that this is being recorded and um, it'll be available on our YouTube page and um, also on our Facebook page. Um, so you can go to, I think it's youtube.com slash um, Barton Health and I'll try to get that up as quickly as possible, but by tomorrow for sure. Um, and I know there's, <laughs> there's like some background questions. If you're an employee on this, this call, you would just enter your point into the Be Healthy Hub and you can um, get credit for attending that way. Um, let's see, Every, a lot of thank yous, a lot of awesome jobs, very informative. <laughs> like, Thanks, Melanie. Yeah. I like giggle when I'm nervous. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Lots of feedback about that. There will be a survey um, at the at the conclusion that you'll get via email, and you are welcome to provide feedback to improve or future topics, anything like that. We love getting that feedback. So appreciate that. Um, but it looked, I don't really see any other questions coming through. I, you must have really nailed it. You really covered all <laughs> the important topics. So oh, it's such a big topic. It can, it's obviously yeah. just a, a foundation, but I hope to, I don't know, I hope it just helps people move forward more confidently. I, I totally agree. Um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll go ahead. Unless there's any other questions, we can give it just another minute yeah. or so, but I feel like Perhaps the the benefit of this talk was anyone that maybe had very specific diets in mind. I think you covered it in a very general sense, which which is really which is awesome. So I got I, I think they have your information. They can call or email if there's any follow up. And I'm also happy to take questions. Um, if you want to email, I'm happy to answer them as well. And with regard to you know admin sort of questions. But um, Ariel, I really appreciate you being here tonight and thanks for the great information. Like I said, we'll get this live on our YouTube page shortly so you can rewatch it if you want to jot down any of the great facts that she had. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their evening. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you guys so much for joining. Have a good night. Have a good night.